equally embraceable. Uh, in fact, it kind of goes just right along with it, in a sense. And so uh, why are they embracing the quantum world and not embracing what you have learned about consciousness? Well, so some, of them, some of them are. So it's, it's typically what happens is the, the older scientists are the ones that are most difficult to change their mind because they have a whole lifetime of experience thinking one way. But the younger ones, who don't have all this baggage about their old models, they are much more interested in this. I mean, the, I, I see it all the time. I'm, I'm constantly being harangued by, by students who are just fascinated by it all, and they want to do some kind of experiments. And it's the new generation that is, is now growing up with uh, quantum mechanics all over the place that I think are going to be the ones that, that will really embrace this to a large extent. So to really make progress, a bunch of people have to die off. Well, that's what Max Planck said, and he was probably right. You know, it, the older you get, the more difficult it is to embrace new ideas. It's, it's just part of the human psyche, I guess. I guess. Um, all right. Uh, are there any efforts underway uh, to use PSI to develop mind-activated technologies? Well, so this this is one way of... Uh, that will finesse the scientific controversy. If somebody comes up with a gizmo and that you can control with your mind, then then the, the game is over as far as people accepting this. And five years ago, there, were, there was nobody who was interested in this. I had been writing about this for many years and anticipating that someone would be doing it. Uh, we now have something like three patents and maybe a half a dozen patents pending, all having to do with the use of the mind in operating equipment. Dean, how do you get a patent like that rammed through? I mean, you know, they're on the edge of not being able to understand a lot of uh, technological mainstream stuff now that's presented to them. I can only imagine walking into a patent office trying to talk to them about what you're trying to talk to them about. Well, of course, the language is done in such a way, so you're not saying, uh, I'm now going to levitate. I want to pass for <laughs> levitation. It's very carefully worded so that the, the patents are, have to do with processes. So, for example, the, the pair random number generator is a, is a process that has to do with the way that you statistically evaluate random numbers. Now, the application of that, as listed in the patent, is for the use of the mind to influence random numbers. From the patent's office point of view, the thing that's being protected, the intellectual property, is that particular process. And so they're not too concerned about whether or not you can demonstrate it right now in front of you, it's more about protecting an idea because the patents go for a long time. It may take 10 years to actually build something that works reliably, but there is a, an enough data uh, behind these ideas, as I said, about 50 years' worth of data to show that there is a real effect. Uh, it's simply not big enough to make it into a reliable device right now, but there's an effect, and so you want to gain all, all of these patents are gaining the intellectual property rights so that people then can, then can develop it with the idea of creating an application. How do you feel generally about uh, people's ability to patent things like this? Uh, if it, uh, I mean, is, is it appropriate to be able to patent something like this? I would prefer that we, we didn't have to go that way because there's a huge amount of additional basic research that needs to take place. But in today's world, in order to get funding to do the research at all, typically you need the patent because then you go to venture capitalists and other people who will give you the funding in order to help push the research along. That's simply the way that leading-edge research takes place today. Sure. Ideally, we would have large organizations like the National Science Foundation in the United States uh, that gives money for speculative research. They would be funding this, but they don't. And so we, we don't have very many options. Mm. Yeah, I imagine money for this is rough, isn't it? It's very difficult to get, get funding for not just this area, but any, any place on the edge of science. It's in, one of the reasons why it's difficult, whereas you know, from my point of view, this is the most exciting stuff. You're, you're really exploring right out there on the bleeding edge. That's where the excitement is. That's what drives me. Was that the leading or bleeding the bleed, edge? That's the bleeding edge, because <laughs> when you're standing out there on the edge, you're, you're also dodging arrows and, and, and yes, I'm sure other nasties. 
Um, All right. Uh, Dean Radin, right here on the bleeding edge. I've never heard it put that way before. This is fascinating, absolutely fascinating stuff from Manila, Philippines, Southeast Asia. I'm Art Bell. That's the place, all right. The sun is high in the sky. It's the middle of the day, and we're into a fascinating topic. Gosh, it doesn't get any better than this. Dean Radin is my guest, and we're talking about, well, actually, the Global Consciousness Project, or, or what is, what's come out of the Global Consciousness Project. We did a series of experiments here on the air many years ago. We produced rain in areas that had... Uh, Great need for rain, and uh, had none in the forecast. And by God, we produced rain. Uh, we did a number of other things, a total of ten or eleven experiments, and uh, it actually became frightening to me. Uh, now, that's that's intention on a very very large scale. Well, uh, Dean Rayton apparently has has looked into ufology, UFOs, and I I'm tr- struggling to understand. What connection there might be uh, between ufology and the research that he's done in the past and present, for that matter, in a moment, we'll ask about exactly that. Once again, uh, Dean Radin. Dean, uh, what in the world does all of this have to do with uh, ufology? I, that's quite a jump and, and an unexpected one, I might add. Well, I've, I've never published an article before on UFOs. And that, that was a strategic decision on my part because when you're dealing with one one topic that's already very controversial, it's usually not too wise to mix another one into it. Yes. Um, but the, the place where I work, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, was founded by the astronaut Edgar Mitchell. And Edgar has not been shy about uh, telling people in many different interviews that uh, he's aware that uh, the, that there are UFOs. And maybe even ETs among us. Actually, uh, Edgar's interviews have becoming or have started to become more and more forceful uh, in in terms of the statements he's made uh, about all this. Right. So I, I I see Edgar every so often, and he's still very active about this. And I've had a number of opportunities to talk to him privately. And and basically, what I what I've asked is, you mean this is for real, like directly to Edgar? And Edgar says, yeah, you know, and says says why. And the story he tells me privately is pretty much the same he's, he says publicly. You know, there's there's real reasons to believe it. So I I've, I probably know as much as any lay person about this, what I've heard on Coast to Coast and other places. So I decided to – I needed to have some kind of response in the magazine that, that our place publishes because we had a lot of inquiries. We have a lot of inquiries from people asking, well, what are we doing with UFOs? And the answer – beforehand was we're not doing anything with ufos we're, we're having enough trouble dealing with consciousness why why add that well so one of the the links is that uh there there are many um psychic types of experiences that people associate with ufos so there's one link the other one was that uh i i know people in in the government and the defense department and i've asked them pretty much the same way i've asked edgar you know, what, what do you do with these reports? Are these reports real? Should we, you know, what, what are we, is, is there something worth worrying about? Right. And I pretty uniformly get positive responses. Uh, it partially, yeah, there is something going on. No, we don't know what it is. So and so the next question I get is after my hair, hair standing up, <laughs> should I be worried? And the answer is, well, probably not, because if, if they're here, they've been here a long time, and they, they don't seem to be bothering too many people, so... I guess it's okay, but you know the, the scientist in me is then think, thinking, "Holy smoke, what what is that? You know, there's, there's something going on." So the next part is uh, I, I read a bunch of books, and the one that I was most impressed with was the one by Richard Dolan, uh, "UFOs and the National Security State," because Richard is is a historian, and he he's written this massive volumes of that simply go through the history. Of, of the reports, and more importantly, the way that the reports have been shaped and, in many cases, covered up. And now we know that they've been covered up because of the Freedom of Information Act. Well, that was kind of an eye-opener. And, and then the last piece of the puzzle was, uh, I know Jacques Vallée, and so I was at a conference recently, a small conference, where Jacques was talking about the, the case of UFOs in Brazil in the late 90s. 